thank you everyone for being here today. I appreciate you being here on such a beautiful sunny afternoon, and we know we haven't had enough of those. Welcome to the WVU College of Law for the 2014 Benedum Lecture. College of Law Professor and Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development, Anne LaFasso, was selected this year to receive the Benedum Distinguished Scholar Award in the category of Humanities and the Arts. This lecture and reception is one way of sharing this achievement with the other excellent scholars and teachers at WVU and celebrating scholarship and excellent teaching across the university. That Professor LaFasso has received this award is no surprise to those of us familiar with her passion for scholarship and teaching and her record of scholarly achievement, which pushes her teaching to higher and higher levels of excellence. Recognizing her excellence in teaching, she received the 2013 Foundation Teaching Award and was named the Law Professor of the Year by the graduating class of 2010. Professor LaFasso brings to WVU rich educational achievement, graduating magna cum laude from Harvard with a master's in history and science, with a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and with a doctorate of philosophy from the University of Oxford, Oxford, England. She's also an experienced labor law attorney, serving as senior attorney in both the appellate and Supreme Court branches of the National Labor Relations Board, law clerk to the Honorable James L. Oakes of the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and associate at the prestigious corporate law firm of Milbank, Tweed, Hadley, and McCloy. Thus, Professor LaFasso exemplifies the ideal scholar, one whose theoretical work is informed by experience and therefore catalyzing change. Recognizing this, NYU Law School's Center for Labor and Employment, the nation's, if not the world's, top research center on this topic, invited Professor LaFasso just this year to be a research fellow at the center. Congratulations, Professor LaFasso. Today, Professor LaFasso will share with you her theory of the autonomous, dignified worker. Through this theory, she has transformed the scholarship, policy, and teaching of labor law. A prolific scholar and outstanding teacher whose work is recognized on international, national, and state levels, Professor LaFasso's contribution to the development and teaching of labor law is grounded in both theory and pragmatic knowledge of the workplace, working conditions in the economy. Her scholarly reach is broad and deep, challenging scholars, policymakers, labor law professors, lawyers, students, workers, and their representatives and employers to address the essential role that worker autonomy and dignity must play in achieving robust economic development. A scholar's achievement is measured by the impact her work has on the world. Against this measure, Professor LaFasso is a giant in her field, the leading legal scholar promoting the autonomy and dignity of working class people. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Anne LaFasso, the 2014 Benedum Distinguished Scholar in the Humanities and the Arts. Uh, can everyone hear me? Not really. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes? Fantastic. Okay. So, first of all, I just want to thank you very much, both um, the provost and my dean, for being here and for, um, for introducing me and this lecture series. This is in the, the um, pinnacle of achievement for me in my life. and. I, I can't tell you how absolutely thrilled I am to be here. This means so much to me. And I meant what I said at the honors ceremony the other day when I said that this place, more than any other university that I've been associated with, has really allowed me to flourish as a teacher and as a scholar, scholar and as a servant to West Virginia, um, to the state of West Virginia, but um, the, the nation 
and the world and our community. I'm going to talk about um, the autonomous, dignified worker. I, I like to walk around, so I hope you don't mind. And I'm going to, that's just me. I just want to thank, this is my senior faculty. I don't have a lot of time to explain, but I do want to point out to Jerry Ashdown that his name is first. And if he wants to know why, we can talk later. But these are all the people I want to thank for being mentors to me for some way or another. And some of the found, my foundational works that I'm going to be drawing upon today, these are some of them. There's probably come a couple of others. But again, if you're interested, I probably have a couple hundred reprints of those in my office. Um, and these are some of the influences on my scholarship. And you probably recognize some of those names, but I'm not going to go through them all. Just by coincidence, today is Equal Pay Day. Uh, my research assistant reminded me of that uh, yesterday, uh, and that was Patrick. And um, this day symbolizes how far into the new year a woman must work to make the same wages that a man made in 2012, and that's in the United States. I looked up the conditions in, um, in West Virginia, and women make 69.9 cents to the dollar that men work make. Um, I talked about that in class today. Now, there might be lots of reasons other than discrimination, but at least it's something to say that we have presumably a long way to go. But we have made strides, and I'm an optimist. So I think it's just important to recognize that. So I'm going to try to do all of that today, and if I have to skip a little bit, I will. But I'm going to talk about the purpose of today. I'm going to give a very brief historical sketch. Um, I'm going to talk about the values underlying some of that history before I introduce the autonomous, dignified worker. And my reason for that is because I want to make sure we're all on the same page because we have philosophers here, historians, law students, lawyers, lawyers who don't know much about labor law, lawyers who know a lot about labor law. So I want to at least bring us on the same page. Um, I'm then going to give a little primer in rights theory, which will be very boring probably to the philosophers in here, but a lot of people won't know other than the philosophers. I'm going to try to generate a hypothetical, ideal, rights-based workplace, ask what Rawls would do in this situation. If you don't know who Rawls is, you will very soon. And then to open it up for questions. So the purpose of today's presentation is to offer a countervailing model for generating laws to govern the workplace grounded in two values, autonomy and dignity. So I'm just going to do one thing today. And all I'm going to do is make a normative claim. And that normative claim, and I'm going to try to at least start to prove, is that the workplace, in order to be the kind of world I want to live in, should be grounded in two values, autonomy and dignity. All right, so here's our historical sketch. I'm going to do those four eras very quickly. So let's start with the pre-modern era. This is Blackstone. Um, up until recent, up until, you know, the 19th century, the way the employee-employer relationship was one of master-servant, which means it's one of status. So that means who you are in society was defined on whether you were the master or the servant. Just like um, parent-child, father-daughter, uh, sorry, parent-child, husband-wife, master-servant. With the first word, the master, the father, the, the, par the, um, the parent, the um, husband, being the dominant one, and the other being the subordinate. Uh, same thing with the master-servant. This is not contract, this relationship. There is no such thing as employment at will, but there is something called the one-year rule, which is just to be fair, when workers didn't have a lot of work, say, in the winter, the master would keep them on. But when there was a lot of work, they would stay there, but then they wouldn't be able to, be, to leave. So if there was no term of employment, we presumed it was for one year, and that was fair to both parties. And we also, this is the very first labor statute, and I'm just going to briefly just tell you that's, this idea is one of the lords did this in Parliament because they wanted to make sure that they had no poaching of their employees or their servants after the Black Death when there was a big um, uh, labor shortage. Okay. They now go many, many hundreds of years into the future. Uh, and we know that during the era of repression, we have an economic transitions 
We're going from a free, from a slave to a free economy. And we also have the rise of unions in part because of the deplorable working conditions during the Industrial Revolution. So we have in the mid, we have the freedom of the so-called freedom of slaves in the middle of the century. And at the same time, we have the Industrial Revolution in the United States. During this time, we can see that there's certainly, there's always government coercion, right? The, the whole nature of government is coercive. In, gov in other words, government makes laws, and they, they, um, they have to sanction people who don't follow those rules. But here, it's particularly coercive in the employment law area. By the way, employment law in the United States is decentralized. We don't have a federal system yet. There is no such thing as employment at will, and it's very important that you know that. Labor unions are illegal, originally as a criminal conspiracy, later as a civil conspiracy, later on as a restraint in trade, even though the Sherman Antitrust Act was not meant to actually um, uh, stop unionization. It was meant to be restraints in um, business trade. It was used very cleverly by lawyers to, to restrain uh, unions. And courts routinely enjoined union conduct. So we see how the government, the state, is, the, is using its coercive powers to, um, to um, repress unions and workers. Um, there's also employer coercion. We know that at the time of the deplorable conditions, working conditions, um, that we have yellow dog contracts which say that the, the employer will not hire you if you are a member of a union. And we have routine violence against union members. I think it's very important to know that the violence in general was against union members, not unions against employers. That doesn't mean that we're not union people who are committing violence but the great majority of violence was against the workers. There was also later on something called company unions where, you, where companies thought, well, if I have to have a union, I should try to control it. So that's also a form of coercion. What we get then is this era of tolerance where you have, uh, it, the era of tolerance allows, this is the Clayton Act and later the Norris LaGuardia Act, and says, okay, labor injunctions we're going to give a, uh, sorry, an immunity to unions, um, and they're not going to be able, you cannot get labor injunctions. Okay, so it removes federal jurisdiction from courts to um, enjoin union activity. Of course, you can enjoin it for violence and things like that. And in general, we don't like violence, we don't like property sabotage, so you can do that. But we're talking about for the lawful ends of coming together for mutual aid or protection. I'm going to talk about Lochner and the idea of the rise of the contract. Employment at will, you're going to see, is status, and then we're going to talk very briefly about the re-repression of the workers, okay? So here also, I just want to very quickly go through this. Tolerance, we're going to see, is these values associated with it. Just remember that. Dignity, liberty, and everyone who knows what Lochner is will know that the, the value is going to be liberty. Status, we're going to talk about coercion. Remember the subordination, the parent, the child, the master, the servant, the father, the daughter. And we're going to talk about the free market or the values that come in to re-repress unions. Okay, so here's the Clayton Act. Remember that's tolerance that I said it was associated with dignity in this case? This is the law of the United States, Section 6 of the Clayton Act. The labor of a human being is not a commodity or article of commerce. I want you to remember that because we're going to get to it later on, okay? The labor of a human being is not a commodity or article of commerce. This is the first Lochner case. I just think it does a great job, better than Lochner itself, of defining the type of liberty they're interested in. And I think it's a beautiful, actually a very beautiful expression of liberty. Liberty it does not mean, means not only the right to be free from incarceration, but embraces the right for a worker to earn his livelihood by any lawful calling, to pursue any livelihood or avocation, and for that purpose to enter into all contracts, which may be proper, necessary, and essential to his carrying out to a successful conclusion of those purposes. What a beautiful, I don't know how anyone could disagree with that definition of liberty. It's, it's even more, more than a negative. It seems like a positive view of liberty, doesn't it? 
in some ways, this era of Lochner is actually, there's some, if you look at the history of status and the repression of the subordinate, there is something very, very attractive about this liberty. Now, in the end, I'm rejecting Lochner. But you, I, I think we have to have a more nuanced view of Lochner. This is actually, again, a pre-Lochner, Lochner case, as I like to call it. But this is the definition of liberty there. Okay. Employment at will. This is the very first employment at will case in the United States. It's not even an employment at will case. It's actually a business tort case. 1884. And the issue there was, is it unlawful for an employer to threaten to discharge employees if they trade with a certain merchant? And you have to know, at the time in the 19th century, what employers would often do is pay you in script, and you'd have to use the company store. Or they pay you in, in, mon in money, but you still have to use the company store, which is obviously very coercive. And the first thing is that, the co that it says is, yeah, if you have a contract of employment, you can't do that. But what if they're at will? This is what the court says. If the employee is at will, such conduct may be censurable and unjust, but not legally wrong. May I not refuse to trade with anyone? May I not forbid my family to trade with anyone? May I not dismiss my domestic servant for dealing or even visiting where I forbid? And if my domestic servant, why not my farmhand or my mechanic or teamster? So we have here the use of status, the use of status to actually help um, bolster the employment at will doctrine. And it's, of course, it's coercion through subordination. Now, repression, um, later on, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this, but I really, this slide is really just to get us on the same page of what are the free market values. So in other words, there's a lot, especially today you see this, that a lot of people don't like, th those people who don't like unions often don't like unions because they believe that they are, they are an obstacle to the free market. And these are some of the values that the free market values, okay? Uh, wealth maximization, profit maximization, productivity, efficiency. My students know there's a difference between those two things. Pro productivity is producing more and more things. Efficiency is doing it faster and faster, okay, or better and better, as opposed to more and more. There's control over terms and conditions of employment that the free market values, managerial control over the employees, and property rights. These are all things that the free market values. Oh, by the way, the free market also values information. I don't put that up there, but that's also important. Okay. So now fast forward to the era of recognition, which is the New Deal. And in the New Deal, we see we have the National Labor Relations Board, which I'm going to talk about. And I think that's autonomy and dignity, those values. Now, we no longer have Lochner, right? Lochner is found on, con it is no longer what we, we use. Um, Lochner is overruled. And we have Employment at will moving closer and closer into the little box of contract. And we have employment at will, which is at once the idea of liberty, meaning freedom of contract, right? But also coercion, it's that status. So we have the marriage of liberty and coercion, which is, seems kind of like the marriage of matter and antimatter, and that there will be an annihilation, but okay. We have tolerance. Um, again, the North LaGuardia Act, which is, is, fills in some of the gaps that, that the Supreme Court pokes into the um, Clayton Act. And we also have, and if we have time in question and answer, I'll talk more about repression, the, the rise of repression again. Okay. So I'm going to just go over Lochner a little more detail very briefly, make sure everyone got, has Lochner. During this era, there's a series of cases where we're looking at the Constitution and this idea there's a cognizable liberty interest under the 14th Amendment. And that cognizable liberty interest is the freedom of contract. And, but there's also this countervailing interest, which is the power of the state, called the police power. And the police power is these traditional powers of the state basically to regulate in the public health and safety and morals. So it's public health, safety, and morals. And there's two ways that liberty wins here. Well, first, you have to find the liberty interest. Once you find the liberty interest, freedom of contract, two ways that 
the regulation, the regulation's always going to infringe on liberty, or almost always, right? That's what laws do. We just said that government's coercive. So what are the two ways? Well, one is that there's no real police power here at, at stake, and the other is it's just simply not justified, the police power, the use of the police power. So again, there's tons of cases, but this is Lochner. Lochner says the freedom of contracts being harmed here by uh, the Bake Shop Act, which says that in New York, um, bakers are not allowed to work more than uh, 10 hours a day or, or 60 hours in one week. So that's obviously a restraint on one's liberty. Remember how we defined it? Liberty to do what you want in terms of your advocation. But actually, the court says no police power. This is not public health. At most, it's about the individual's health, which is, and they don't use these words, but which is, I'm using these words now, labor law. So no police power. So if there's no police power to balance this, liberty wins. OK, these are the two dissents. And they, they're actually kind of similar. Everyone always talks about them, or a lot of people talk about them, how different they are. But I actually kind of find them pretty similar. So the first one, Holmes, talks about that there's this, this infiltration of this economic theory. But he also talks about, look, regulations interfere with liberty. That's what I've been saying, right, this whole lecture. So, but regulation is constitutional unless, this is what you should find, unless a rational and fair man necessarily would admit that the statute proposed would infringe fundamental principles as they have been understood by the traditions of our people in our law. So in other words, look, let the, let the democratic process work this out. The people in New York wanted to have a baker's law. Let them have a baker's law. Harlan says, if you look at the empirical evidence, there's tons of empirical evidence that this is, that this is an exercise of the police powers. And says also, if there's any doubt to the validity of, this, of a regulation or statute, you, it must be resolved in favor of validity. OK. So everyone got, by the way, just to be sure, Lochner is not good law. Right? Overruled. Just so everyone knows, this is not, I know there are very sad libertarians in, my, in this audience right now, but it is, not, it is not the law right now. Maybe someday again, but not right now. All right. So what we see coming out of Lochner is this very specific view of liberty or autonomy, where it's the individual's right to engage in whatever activity she wishes. Freedom of contract is arrogated to a cognizable liberty interest under the Constitution that's protected under the Constitution. Now, to be sure, under the Lochner era, we are accepting some limits of liberty, but not as many as progressives. And I'm not talking about progressives of the time. Progressives would be, they're interested in more regulation of business. And these limits are narrowly defined. And you can see that in Lochner itself, where the health and safety of these bakers is not even a public health issue in the, in the view of the majority there. OK. So, the New Deal, specifically the National Labor Relations Act, completely rejects this view. It makes specific findings, and this is the law. This is literally the law. I know it's going to upset some people, but this is in the actual language of the statute. Freedom of contract is illusory. Freedom of association, this, this part is in the Supreme Court case. Freedom of association under the National Labor Relations Act is a fundamental right. Inequality of bargaining power burdens commerce. And basic fairness requires us to encourage the practice and procedure of collective bargaining. That's our law. So we've got to start. That's, and I'm a big rule of law person. I like the law. OK, that's why, one of the reasons I became a law professor. So that's our law, and that's what we're starting with. Now, just for those of you who don't know the law, for my non-lawyers here, this is the rights that you're given under the, uh, the Wagner Act. This is Section 7 grants the right to self-organization, form, join, assist labor organizations, bargain collectively through representatives of workers' own choosing, and engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. Note that not every right granted under the Wagner Act is a right to have a union. The more important right is freedom of association, to engage in concerted activities for the purpose of other mutual aid or protection. 
Yes, it also protects the right to actually formally form a union, but it protects this more fundamental right. And what's a right without a duty, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. And Section 8 imposes these five duties on employers, and employers engage in an unfair labor practice, or it's unlawful for an employer to interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees in the exercise of their Section 7 rights, to form company unions. Remember the company unions we talked about? To discriminate against employees because of their union status, to retaliate, or to refuse to bargain collectively with employee representatives with unions. Okay, and that's how we enforce this, these rights under Section 7. Okay, that should give us some common ground to get to the autonomous, dignified worker. All right, so you see what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about autonomy, dignity, and then I'm going to look at some work policies. All right, so worker autonomy, what does it mean to put what I call part author of one's work life? I'm going to start with personal autonomy because I derive worker autonomy from Raz's notion of personal autonomy. The ruling idea behind the ideal of personal autonomy is that people should make their own lives. The autonomous person is a part author of his own life. The ideal of personal autonomy is the vision of people controlling, to some degree, their own destiny, fashioning it through successive decisions throughout their lives. Autonomy is opposed to a life of coerced choices. So I read that, I think around to, uh, 1990 something, uh, I was reading this and I loved it. And I decided to adopt it as my own. So what does it mean to be part author of one's own working life? I, I just love that, being part author of one's working life. Worker autonomy is simply that aspect of personal autonomy whereby the autonomous worker is a part author of his or her work life, controlling to some degree his or her own destiny through successive decisions. You can see why I will say later on autonomy is more foundational than, say, participation or democracy, which is grounded in autonomy. Those are important values, but this is an even more fundamental value because look at the definition. You're part author of your life and you do it through decision making. Well, you need certain prerequisites to be able to make wise decisions. You need a mental ability to identify work-life influences, which means you need to have a good educational system. It's absolutely vital to what I want to do. You need access to information sufficient to generate a range of options to workers. And that, by the way, is very compatible with the free market. You need independence from, and sorry for the spelling error there, from coercion. Okay? Now, there's always going to be some coercion, okay? And we're going to talk about that. It's just like the same thing with the um, homes, the descent. I mean, there's always going to be some friction in any kind of work rule or any kind of regulation. But you need as much independence as possible from coercion, and you need some mode of participation that empowers workers to affect changes in their working lives. Now, what we're also going to see is that I think unions are one of many modes of participation. So I'm not necessarily saying that unions are the best mode, but I'm going to focus on it today in part because we have unions. That's our basic mode of participation in the United States. It's been histor of historical importance in the United States, so I'll talk about that. But don't, get, don't take what I'm saying that I think unions are necessarily the best mode of participation. I'm not opining on that today. So here's my conclusion. To be autonomous, workers must know what issues affect their working lives and know how to resolve those issues according to their own interests, have access to information relevant to making informed choices, be free to effectively decide how to decide those issues, and have effective modes of participating in the decision-making process. Now, this is important. Again, I know I already said this, but I want to make it crystal clear. Coercion. The ability to influence behavior through threats, punishments, and sanctions. Government has that power, right? In my view, government is the most coercive source of power in the American's life today, and in most people's lives. It has the power to take your life, liberty, or property. 
But don't forget, private employers are also coercive. They have the ability, the power to control your livelihood. They have the authority to fire, transfer, discipline. They have the authority to make and enforce work rules. This is a source of coercion. That doesn't tell us much other than it's a source of coercion. We may choose to want that source of coercion, but it is a source of coercion. Dignity. All right. The ruling idea behind the ideal of dignity is that individual members of a community should treat each and every other member of that community as persons of independent moral worth. Dignity demands that we treat all people equally because they are human. This is a subtle concept, sometimes difficult for non-philosophers to get. Okay? And it doesn't mean that we have to treat all people the same regardless of circumstances. Now, Kant has several formulations of the categorical imperative, but I'm going to use his humanity principle. Act so that you always treat people as an end and never merely as a means. Okay? So that's Kant's humanity principle. So let's see, taking Kant and adding it to, that was Dworkin above, and let's see what we get. Humans are ends in themselves, unique moral worth of every human being, the only appropriate response to such a being is respect. To treat someone as a means is by definition to fail to treat someone with respect, is to fail to dignify that person. Okay? Now, we'll see in a second that that doesn't mean we can't punish and it doesn't mean we can't reward. But you don't punish someone because of their humanity. You don't reward someone because of their, you, you, you punish someone because of the, an act they did. But that is not what we're talking, well, well let's see, we'll see, it's easier to talk about it in the, in the application. Okay. So let's look at what policies might maximize employer of autonomy and dignity. Policies favoring any form of workplace participation, I think that's pretty obvious. Rights to information, consultation, bargaining, or co-determination. Policies that command the equality of respect of each person based on that person's humanity. So, you know, that's why we have anti-discrimination laws. They're actually digni they're, they're dignifying people, right? As I said, we can still reward workers for their good performance because we're rewarding them because of their good performance. And we can punish workers for poor performance or misconduct. But when employers engage in coercive acts, because, right, punishment's still coercive. If you steal from an employer, you're probably going to get fired. You're not going to get a big argument from me for firing someone who's stolen from you. Okay? That's misconduct. It's still a coercive act. So you must do it, in my mind, in a manner that does not infringe on the worker's dignity. Again, I would fire someone who stole from me under most circumstances. So don't misunderstand what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, this is the philosophers can go to sleep for a couple of minutes. And this is for the non philosophers in the room. I'm going to talk about rights theory. Okay, so John Stuart Mill, when we call anything a person's right, we mean that he has a valid claim on society to protect him in the possession of it. This is Hofeld. Hofeld wants to denote any sort of legal advantage. And notice one of those is a claim, and I want to focus on claims. So rights as claims a duty or a legal obligation is that which one ought or ought not do. If X has a right against Y, that Y shall stay off X's land, the correlative and equivalent is that Y is under a duty toward X to stay off the place. So Raz, I think, does a fantastic job of wrapping this all up. And what he says is that every right has a correlative duty. So every claim right, we're talking about claim right. In other words, if I have a right, I can claim a duty against someone. They owe me something. That's, otherwise, it's not a right. It might be a privilege, it might be an immunity, but it's not a right. The rights holder has to have the capacity to hold the right. Capacity means that they have to be of ultimate moral worth. That's an interesting debate we can get into about whether corporations should have rights. Or do they only have rights on behalf of work of, sorry, of, of um, um, stakeholders, whether they're shareholders or whoever? Now, every right 
is based on an interest of someone, and every interest is grounded in a value. This is RAS. Now, in terms of rights holders, I'm only going to be talking about rights holders as employees and duty holders as the uh, owners or the employers today. But here, or this is an even better picture, what we have is this relationship where values ground everything. I like this because it shows the values, there's the least amount of values. Interests, all rights are based on interests. You can have tons of rights. You can make up lots of different things, and they're grounded in, in values. Okay? And remember what my values, I like autonomy and dignity, right? Okay, so let's now the hypothetical ideal rights-based workplace. All right, so we're going to identify workers' interests and then the values, okay, and then contrast them with employers. All right, here are some, I think, non-controversial interests of all workers. Job security, which can include income replacement, wages, benefits, including health benefits and other benefits, hours, work location, working conditions, uh, which can include freedom from coerced labor and things like that. And general training. Workers want general training in general. Now, they also, these are just a couple of others that we don't think about as much, but workers might want as an interest to provide, they might want meaningful work. We do think about providing for one's family, to be kept busy, a social outlet. It defines them as persons. So these other interests of workers. So let's now try to link this to values. I think there are five values, but I think the first two are more foundational. That's autonomy, dignity, participation, democracy, and justice. I think, and I, look, I, if anyone thinks I'm wrong, that's fine. I'm, I'm just happy if we can all agree on these five as values. Okay? I just personally think the other two are more foundational. But autonomy, dignity, participation, democracy. So what does it mean to become part author of one's working life. Dignity. What does it mean to treat every worker as persons with independent moral worth? Participation. What does it mean to participate in decisions affecting one's work life? Democracy. What does it mean to have an equal say in those decisions? Justice. What does it mean to create a just workplace where the fruits of one's labor are fairly distributed? Now, here are the four rights that the ILL, the International Labor Organization, has come up with that they think are the absolute most fundamental rights, not, not values. Freedom of association, that's unions, um, and other forms of participation. Elimination of all forms of compulsory labor, so no slavery, no child labor, no employment discrimination. And that's the order in which they say them. Okay. So let's just see on a very superficial level how the United States is doing. And I would say on a superficial level, we are doing very well. We have freedom of association under National Labor Relations Act Section 7. We have eliminated, or we have eliminated slavery, at least legally, and that's the 13th Amendment. Uh, we have eliminated child labor under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And we have eliminated, and what I mean eliminate, this doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means that legally we have regulated this area. Okay? So we have civil rights. All right? These are all different types of civil rights based on different protected classes. So at least superficially, we have legislation that is doing what the ILO thinks we should be doing. And that's good news, right? Now I would like to compare interest. Those are, remember, those are our interests, our main interests, to management's interests. Management is not interested, remember also, that management has a duty to the owner in a corporate form that could be the shareholders, ultimately. But it, it will depend on the form of the firm of what that will look like. So just a reminder of what that is, okay? But labor is interested in job security. Management's not. It likes employment at will. Labor is interested in living wages, but management wants low cost, profit maximization, productivity, and efficiency. So while labor wants this living wage and good benefits, that's at odds with the interest of managers to make money, profit maximize. While labor wants a certain control over their hours and their work locations, managers want to control them. 
They also want to preserve their property. Now, managers are not per se interested in good working conditions. They're interested in minimizing liability. That doesn't mean that they don't see that it's in their interest to have good working conditions. But that's not what their main interest is. Their interest is in minimizing liability. And they're not interested in training you for, the, for their competitors. They're interested in, they will train you for firm-specific training. We're seeing that right now in law schools where law firms are saying, you've got to generally train them better. You've got to do more training. They don't, that's not, the worker's interest is to get as much training as possible to make them as, to make them as marketable as possible. Okay. This just means, I mean, this is okay. I mean, if I were an employer, those would be my interests, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Let's look at the values. Remember our values for workers? Well, here's management's values. Management does not value your autonomy. It does value coercion. It doesn't want you to have autonomy. Just like government values coercion, right? It makes laws. Workers value their dignity. Management sees labor as a factor of production. Now let's go back to Kant. Remember, never treat someone as, an, as a means, only as an ends. By definition, even call, and look, I talk to lots of managers, they call labor a factor of production. I can't think of almost anything more undignified than that. Remember, labor is not a commodity. Remember that from Section 6 of the Clayton Act? Totally at odds, these values. Management doesn't value your participation. Yes, a good manager wants to, to tell them stuff and report and be their eyes and their lookout, their eyes and ears on the ground, but they want to have ultimate authority to make decisions. That's their value. They want loyalty to them not some sort of equal say in the decision-making process. And whether there's justice or not, they need to deal with productivity, efficiency, ma wealth maximization. That's one of the reasons they want employment at will. Because employment at will means it's less costly to fire you when they want to fire you. Even if it's for, they just don't want to get into the reasons. They might have decent reasons, but they don't want to have to do the paperwork. It costs them money in a capitalist society. All right, but there are values in common. Workers and the firm are interested in the firm's financial well-being because the employees wouldn't have a job without the firm. But the parties disagree about how wealth, which is the product of labor and capital working together, should be distributed. And keep in mind that the workers are also consumers. I didn't even, I'm not going to get into that today, but that's a whole other complication is how do consumer interests and values play into this? And they play very, very heavily into it. Okay. So if this goes to resource distribution, there's many ways of, of deciding resource distribution. Unilateral is the traditional way in the United States. But we can also have co-determination, which is done to some extent in Germany. You could bargain in unionized sectors. You could do individual bargaining. You could bargain collectively, consult, get information. But I will say that if you're a worker, you want some sort of participation on who decides. That's your voice function. And so what would Rawls do? And this is my last part of the presentation before I open up to questions. So philosophers go to sleep again. I'm going to do a little primer on, on Rawls. We're going to do, a, he, Rawls does a thought, thought experiment. He says the original position is a type of moral point of view. He does this thought experiment about the social contract. And he wants to eliminate bias by having this, these people sitting together who are similarly unsituated. What does that mean? Those in the hypothetical original position are ignorant of all knowledge of who they are. They might be, that might be the basis of some sort of self-interested bias. So they don't know whether, what their gender, race, ethnicity, wealth, abilities, or social circumstances are. So imagine taking all these people and putting them in a room like that. They don't, know, they don't know much about themselves. Those in the original position under a veil of ignorance would agree, so there's your social contract idea, on legitimate and fair principles of justice. And those principles are the liberty and the difference principles. And he says under these conditions, people would come to agree, at least Americans, would come to agree to these two principles. 
Now, he's not saying actual agreement in reality. See, on the right, that's the reality. We have a diverse population, and they might agree to many sorts of things. He says, behind the veil of ignorance, this would be a reasonable agreement, not the actual agreement that would happen in reality with the way people are. So, those beliefs that would be chosen by rational people behind a veil of ignorance in the original position upon reflective equilibrium. Okay? Now, he says to be rational, and look what he says. They must have an interest in all these goods, which look a lot like autonomy and dignity, frankly, to me. Liberty, opportunity, some income, some health, education. We talked about education earlier, self-respect. And he says, if you put these people in a room and you get them to say, how are we going to organize society? We have to have, we'll go back and forth until we come to a logical, coherent position. And that will be our principles. So the liberty principle is each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with a similar liberty for others. And the difference principle, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today, but basically it is you can't make any move in society that makes the worst off representative person worse off. So it's, sort, it's a Pareto, in economic terms, it's a Pareto efficiency move. So, are unions compatible with the liberty principle? And absolutely, right? Unions are a microcosm. They are a social entity, a social unit that's a microcosm of our democracy. They are freedom of association. They are freedom of speech. Now, going back to Rawls. Rawls does not advocate absolute liberty. And he does not advocate equal distribution of those liberties classified as basic. I'm sorry, he does, he does, does advocate equal distribution. But he also advocates a limiting principle, harm. Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with a similar liberty of others. So there is a limiting principle there. Okay? Just make sure you understand. So liberty... Again, he's recognizing a fairly sophisticated idea of liberty that liberty just doesn't mean I get to do whatever I want. All right. I'm sorry, forgive me, because to get this is a complex argument, so there's layers of it. Okay. So let's go back and review for a second. Government is coercive, which is why those in the original position would advocate for the liberty principle. Now, there's many solutions. These are two. One thing you can do is you could have big government, which you remember, government's coercive, but you could also have big business to counteract big government, right? You could just keep on letting capital accumulate and accumulate. Or you could have a limited government and narrow police powers. That's sort of the Lochner view, right? There's many, many solutions. But what's the problem? Both of these allow for a certain business autonomy, right? But what's the problem with business autonomy? Businesses are coercive. We already talked about that. And remember, we want autonomy, which is freedom from coercion. And remember this slide? So, government is coercive, which is why rational people in the original position would derive the liberty principle. Businesses, especially collectivized labor, have the potential to be as coercive, maybe some people more think more coercive. The private public partnerships are potentially the most coercive. I'll talk about that. Ensuring that workers and managers participate in the decision over resource distribution goes a long way toward maximizing liberty and dignity for all, because why? It increases democratic participation. It augments the uh, autonomy of those participating. It potentially decreases the autonomy of the capitalist. Right? That's not good. But I say, so what? Because that's like saying that the Magna Carta decreased the autonomy of the king. Yep, it does. You're right. But I care about democracy. I care about participation. I care about increasing autonomy among more people and dignifying people and not treating them as factors of production. Okay. Just a quick example of the public-private coercion. All right. So Pareto efficiency demands that no one be more, made worse off by a move, a regulation, or conduct, or whatever. Caldor-Hicks efficiency, which is what the law values, 
economists tend to use Pareto efficiency. The law tends to use Calder-Hicks. Demands only that the increase in economic value be sufficiently large that the losers can be fully compensated. The lower the labor standards, the less costly to breach them, right? So let's just take an example. There's a coal mine explosion. Either you're going to have no liability, and you, one way to have no liability is if the coal, miners have no the coal mine operators have no duties. That's a way to have Calder Hicks efficiency pretty quickly. Or the coal mine operator can be forced to compensate the families of those killed or injured, right? And they'll go through a risk analysis. That's normal business. We know businesses do this. This is a completely acceptable practice. And one reason why rational employers, firms, want lower labor standards. They want lower, they want lower standards because they can meet them easier, one reason, and they, it costs less. To me, that's a problem. Okay? It may not be a problem to you. I get it. I understand that. It's a problem to me. I'm, I'm concerned about that. All right. By the way, turns out union mines are safer than non-union mines. And there's lots of reasons for that. And one of the reasons is because union mines actually monitor better. We could talk about that. I see that Pat McGinley's here. He might want to talk about that. All right. So, um, yes, are unions, are unions likely to augment autonomy? This is what unions do to augment autonomy. Again, this is not the only solution. This is a solution. This is why people might want to have a union. They can bargain collectively. They grieve and arbitrate disputes. They strike. They picket. They boycott. They do unprotected but not illegal activity like work slowdowns. They work to rule. I, you know what work to rule is. Just do exactly what you're told and nothing more. They handbill. They boycott. By the way, secondary boycotts are unlawful or often are. Political action and lobbying. And they can engage in civil disobedience, which is a whole nother part of ultimately what I'm going to write about, is civil disobedience. Now, unions do those things. What do managers do? They want unilateral decision-making authority. They don't want to bargain collectively. They want narrow, if they are going to bargain collectively, they want narrow subjects of bargaining. They want to withhold information. And you can't blame them, right? If you withhold information, you have a market advantage, right? Free markets work better with more information. If you withhold information, you have an advantage. It makes sense. I don't like it. Workers don't like it. They want the information. Management rights, they, they discipline, discharge. They have property rights. They have legal justifications. They have managerial, their legal justifications can be managerial control, efficiency, production. And they also have their economic weapons. Okay? So those are their means. Oh, uh, they also have political action and lobbying. Sorry. Okay, not going to talk about that. Okay, so reasons to protect private sector unions. These are my five reasons. Here, let's just go into it. Fosters individual rights, autonomy and dignity, right? I'm going to do this very quickly. They, they protect communal rights, and those are all your Section 7 rights. Those are communal rights that unions do. They strengthen democracies by strengthening... Through self-governments, we increase the sense of political empowerment of those who are members of unions. Frequent participation in self-government at, at a social level, as social unit, increases, it makes people more politically astute. Union members vote more. There's a reason. They're used to doing things like that. There's tons of studies on this. They facilitate justice in the workplace because of their grievance arbitration and their just cause standards and their due process. And unions are a free market solution to a free market problem. Remember, this is the law. They equalize bargaining power. They remove obstructions to commerce. They facilitate freedom of contract. And I will take questions. Thank you to all these people. And a big thank you to my husband and my daughter who are here. And I think I had one more. And to all the invisible workers whose work made today happen. Thank you. Any questions? You 
skipped quickly over the interests of consumers, but I was interested in your thoughts on how um, the interests of consumers and all of our uh, participation in the marketplace as consumers, whether we're workers or managers, um, plays into this question of what we would choose from the original position. Well, one of the reasons I, I skipped over consumers is because I haven't done research on it yet, so I don't have anything to say. Um, but, and I bring it up because I think it's something that labor lawyers forget about. And I think it's important, so it's a research agenda of mine. I don't think it's going to change much of autonomy and dignity because remember, most consumers are workers. So I do think what it's going to do, I actually think if, if consumers are in the original position, they'll come around, my hypothesis is they'll come around to a more pro-labor, I don't mean that union, I mean pro-employee point of view than they have. Because they'll see themselves as in, in a community of workers as opposed to, I don't care what you get, I want to get mine, and I need to get my groceries today. But that's just a hypothesis. I could be wrong, and then the whole thing you know, might change. So it's a great question. I wish I could answer it better. But that's where I am. That's my hypothesis that I need to test. So you talked about um, Lochner and, and kind of where this fits in. And, and there is a libertarian, you know, libertarians like the Lochner concept and knowing the history of Lochner, at least as I understand it, what part of the history was it was a, the, the law that was passed was in fact a, a public-private partnership um, to bar ethnic minorities from working longer and harder. And so there's an argument notwithstanding the actual rationale of the majority of Lochner that it got the outcome right in that sense of coercive power. And I'm curious how that fits in with um, the autonomy and dignity because it seems to me that there were two groups of workers um, being put at risk in the Lochner decision in the first place. Well, you know, I, I think that scholarship is really off in all honesty. Um, it's true that, that the, the New York um, Baker's Law, um, there were certainly people lobbying because they didn't want, um, because some ethnic minorities wanted, some wanted longer hours and others wanted shorter hours. But it doesn't change the conclusion. So I've, I've read a lot of that scholarship and I find it completely just wrong. Uh, uh, that scholarship tends to say that Lochner was an immigration case. Lochner's not an immigration case, it's a labor law case. It's a constitutional law case. Um, it's, you know, so what, now, when I first read Lochner, I have to say, I thought, I couldn't believe it was struck down, that was my view. Um, whether or not that means that some ethnic minorities don't get to kill themselves working to death, I, you know, I, I personally think there's something wrong with that. If people think it's okay to let people work 60 hours a week and breathe in flower particles that were causing something like black lung, you know? And maybe some of those people that did that were racist. And that's a bad motive. That's definitely a bad motive when we do things like that. But that doesn't mean that the law is not a good law. And that's a whole different debate. And I think the people do, engaging in that scholarship are missing that whole understanding of what's going on with the labor movement during that point. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Um, going towards your point in terms of you offer up uh, unions as a way of workers having a right to speak and to get the autonomy. Uh, but in today's day where you have states where there's right to work states, and you're dealing with the decreasing amount of union participation as a whole in the private sector. Can you maybe uh, expand on alternative ways uh, that you've done through your research? Mm -hmm. I think works councils would be a great way to do this. Um, I think um, more, I'm really a person who likes participatory government more than representative government, and unions are really representative government. So if I had my, if I were like the queen or the philosopher queen, I would actually want, you know, wave my magic wand and have more of a participatory form of government in the workplace. Um, but that's not what we have. We have, and there are, I mean, there are coercive pa powers at, at work in unions. We know that. But the idea that unions are more coercive than business Honestly, if you believe that, then we should go out and have a glass of wine or beer, whatever you want, and talk about that because you can't possibly think that 
employers are not more coercive than unions. Unions are, can be a form of coercion, absolutely. Okay, and I have problems with that. But, and that's why I like direct democracy better. Now there's problems with direct democracy. If something's too big, you need more representative democracy and all that. But, um, so I think Europe has a lot of really good councils, partnerships, labor management partnerships. The Faculty Senate is a really good example of a partnership. Um, it's representative, that's true, but instead of direct democracy, though occasionally you get direct democracy. But things like that, I think, um, community-based um, efforts. There's a lot of like minority groups and immigrant groups right now that come together and they're not labor unions and they're doing tons of really good things to help workers. And all those things, I love those things. I like them a lot better than unions even. But unions are, are, are more effective in what they do right now. They're very effective. Um, within the next century, uh, robotic automation will, uh, I think, uh, displace large numbers of workers. Okay, you're stealing all of my new research, but go ahead. Uh, I, I think the net effect of, uh, of that would be that it increases the course of power of, uh, of employers because the supply of available labor would increase um, as a result of this. How do we advance the interests of autonomy and dignity when um, into the foreseeable future the coercive power of employers will only increase? This is, I love this question so much. Of course, you always give me great questions. You're such a great student. Um, I am so fascinated by the idea of robots, especially androids. And at some point, and this is why, okay, there's, in one sense, these robots are really technology that's displacing workers. Now, you're going to be surprised about what I'm about to say, okay, but I'm going to say this. I have no problems with displacement of workers as long as there's training and there's ways of getting them new jobs because I like technology, okay? I think displacement is not great, but it's, you can, instead of getting rid of technology and progress, let's figure out a way to lessen the harm to the workers. Okay, so that sounds very free market. I have very mixed views on these types of things, okay? But what happens, I think the next, the, the really cool question here that I really want to research is what if these robots, we can make, you're going to laugh at me, but what if we can make sentient beings? that they think and they feel, do they get autonomy and dignity? Because the way I've defined dignity is something unique to humans. So, and your question is about the technology and it's gonna become more coercive. Well, I think one thing we have to do is we have to, as a society, figure out how to retrain people to get into different jobs. We obviously can't have a class of, work, of people who do not work. You can't have a class of people. It's not in anyone's interest. So we, we'll, we'll have to see as, as those things go. But I, I love the whole robot stuff. Thank you. Mr. President. Thank you. I, I want to thank you for this wonderful tour of philosophy and law and ask you about the, uh, the, uh, how you would work through, uh, in your theory, uh, the rights of the autonomous and dignified college football player. I knew someone was going to ask me that question today. So. I haven't read the Northwestern case, but let's assume the facts as portrayed are, are accurate. I've been saying for years that college, the college athletes are, in some instances, are employees. So I'm thrilled at the decision in the sense that um, if those facts are accurate, which I don't know if they're accurate in Northwestern, because when the NLRB decides that a class of workers are employees for purposes of the National Labor Relations Act, it's not deciding that that class is always employees. It's only deciding for that particular workplace in this particular time, they are employees, under, they're statutory employees, and therefore they have the rights to unionize, okay? So assuming that they are employees, then they have a right to have a vote, up or down. Now, this can cause, I haven't, you know, I would love to talk to you about this, David, because, you know, is this, we don't really know, let's say this is upheld by the courts. And again, assuming the facts are correct, so substantial evidence supports the regional director's findings. Okay. Um, then I think legally it's correct. Now that doesn't mean the courts will agree with me because the courts get it wrong sometimes. But I, I'm, I'm serious though in this case. Sometimes I'm kidding around, but I'm actually serious in this case. But 
so in other words, I don't know whether the courts will find these to be workers, but let's say they do. What's interesting to me, and this is something Elaine and I were thinking about writing about over the, over the summer, uh, although now she's looking at me like, no, I don't want to do it, now you've, made, you've outed me. But, all right, at least I'm thinking about writing. Is what will that do, does that hurt or help West Virginia University? Because we're not affected by the decision at all, in the sense of directly affected. Because our employees, one, are public employees, sorry, our football players are public, are public workers or students, whatever, okay, if they're workers, then they're public. And in West Virginia, there's, there's a right to associate, so they can form a union, but West Virginia University has no obligation to bargain with them. Unless, and is Bob Bastard still here? Because Bob would know. Um, unless there's something I don't know, some exception that I don't know in West Virginia law. Okay, so it shouldn't affect us, but that doesn't mean it won't, we, some students have told me they think it's gonna be terrible for West Virginia because then we're gonna have to compete with salaries. And I thought, really? Because I would think that employers wouldn't want this and they're gonna fight it, meaning universities, private universities. So, um, on the other hand, maybe this is a wake-up call that we've been treating athletes not as scholar athletes, but as athlete workers, and that maybe we should change how we, we can, because we can always restructure the, the football team so they're not workers. Remember what I said in the beginning is that when the board decides that someone is a worker, they're only a worker for purposes of that particular structure in that particular time, not forever. So maybe we should be restructuring this because maybe, they, maybe we're not doing right by them and they're not really scholar athletes. Or not being treated like scholar athletes. And the management model seems to work very well on a football team. But I wonder what risk you think there is other than losing power and control that management has that it views that it's an intolerable risk uh, to reject the full participation of uh, labor well, in those decisions. And then second, okay, I right. wonder if it's, we're doing this just by default. It's the way we've always done it. Is this football you're or, talking about? Or, it's not. No. Oh, okay. Or is it, uh, is it by design? Okay, so the first question, and I might ask you to, to sort of clarify your second question. So the first question is whether, um, why, are peop why are managers so anxious or so negative on unions? Why do they fight unions so much? Well, his historically, we have an up and down picture of that. So, and some managers don't. And some have very high trust relationships with their workforce, and they think, well, this is great because unions discipline my workforce, and, which is one reason that some managers like them. I think the ones who come out most vociferously against unions tend to have an ideological problem with unions. So if you look at like the Walmart family and some of the things they say, like I'm in the, st um, I'm in the steering wheel. I'm, I mean, I'm in, I'm in the car and I'm behind the steering wheel. I mean, they literally say things like that. You know, that's very ideological to me. And maybe even potentially short-sighted. Now, I'm not currently a manager of a, of, a private, of a private enterprise. So it may be that in a specific enterprise, it's, it's better, that, let, me, let me take that back. I also think it goes back to Calder Hicks efficiency. The less I am, I have a duty to someone else, the lower my labor costs, and the easier it is for me to maximize profit. I just think that's rational. We've even created that incentives in the law. So when I tell my students this, I say, I, these are not evil employers who are doing this. Well, even when they hate unions, it's not like they're evil. They're rational most of the time. Some of them, I think, are a little irrational when they start talking about steering wheels and things. And it's like they go crazy over things, you know? But I think most of the time, most business people are trying to make rational decisions. And they're thinking, well, I don't want to, I don't want to have to talk to people because that's costing me time. All right, so now your second question. Maybe that risk is uh, inefficiency or the giving up of power or that sort well, of thing. Well, it's some of it is the it, at least I'm going to say Calder Hicks efficiency because it might be more allocatively efficient, Pareto efficient to actually talk to your workforce. 
So it's different types of efficiency. So talking, I have, a, I have an article called Talking is Worthwhile. And sometimes I would think, you know, you're a mediator, so I'm sure you agree with that. So sometimes it's more efficient to actually find out from the workers what's going on on the assembly line or whatever it is. And if you don't talk to them and you just, you know, dictate it, you're going to get it wrong. It was like, there's a good example with the Nazis, right? So the Nazis wanted to come up with the, with the atomic bomb. And so they're trying really hard to come up with the atomic bomb. But apparently, I forget whether it was a two-dimensional matrix or a three-dimensional matrix, but it had to be one or the other. Well, the older German guys could only see it a certain way. And so the younger guys started seeing it differently, but they said, no, we don't listen to you because there's a command authority. So the Americans get the bomb first because they had more participation and more, their science was done in a more participatory manner. That's efficient. It was not very efficient to be dictatorial and say, you're going to do it this way. And then they went off and they did the rockets instead and whatever. So, so sometimes they're, they're, they're shooting themselves in the foot. That makes sense to me. I uh, mediated a lot of cases, uh, labor cases, uh -huh. where uh, management rearranges the furniture in, in labor's uh, living room without ever asking uh, labor whether you like it that way or not. Or and if I, it works. And, or if it works. And right. I wonder if we do that uh, by design or ah. if we just do that by default because that's simply the way we've always done I it. Think and the, and the reason I ask is that often I'll see a person that moves out of labor into management and they put on a different hat. Okay. They, they understand it as a laborer, but somehow okay. they have blinders. Has Two things. One is I think in most cases, this is just a guess, default rather than design. I think people, you know, we in the society have, we believe in management rights. It's just sort of part of our culture right now. And so we just do those things. I don't think when managers are moving the furniture around, they're just, they're intentionally trying to bother you. Sometimes, I think they're actually not, they're not thinking, really. I really believe that. I think what happens when a lot of people who move from labor to management, they were never really, they always, they're a manager type. You know, they might even be like the person, I mean, right now I'm a manager, right? Okay, I'm associate dean, right? But um, that doesn't mean that moving from a faculty position to this managerial position, all of a sudden I'm like, telling, well, not that they ever listen to me because I'm not their boss. This is a bad, this is a very bad analogy. I'm going to be quiet on this, okay? But, yeah, okay, all right, I'll, sh I'll shut up, okay? But I do think you often see the person who's the shop steward become manager, and then they want to be dictatorial. They want to do that. And I think that's just their personality. You see that personality type wanting to do that. And I think it's about that person wants just to have control over things. And managers like to control things. John? Thanks for the tall can. Um, I just wanted to ask you something about sort of how you're using Rawls here. And this I was waiting for this long. question. Okay. So, so, so the basic notion is you're taking sort of basic Rawlsian ideas and applying them to the labor management context. And so the idea is that that's going to drive you in a more egalitarian direction because you say in the original position, nobody knows whether you're management or labor, so you're going to worry. So Rawls is thought is people are risk averse and they're going to sort of choose basic principles that would make me better off if I'm a laborer. Right, so have I got you so far? Um, for purposes so far, but I'd like I mean, to back out. I mean, um, I, mean, that's I mean, that's rough. I mean, that's John rough is very good at, going, at putting right? you. Yes, okay. I mean, I'm not trying to trap you. I'm just trying oh, to, yes, I mean, you are. I'm just trying to understand something. <laughs> so, so the basic idea then is, is you know, Rawls is thinking, if, if, if you buy all that, Rawls is thinking is going to drive you in a very egalitarian direction. You have a difference principle. We're not going to have inequalities unless they make the, the least well off, you know, better off. Right. right. Um, so there are two ways you could do this, right? You could just say, well, if we're doing Rawls on management and labor, then the notion is you're going to have sort of all the profits of the collective enterprise shared in a very egalitarian way, and any differences in who shares in the profits are going to have to be justified by the idea that these mm -hmm. differences make the least well off better off, right? So you could do it in terms that you could just sort of go straight there. Right, which mm -hmm. would be a very egalitarian set of principles compared mm -hmm. to how American society works. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem to me that that's kind of what you did. It seems like no, what you said that. instead was, well, if we go through this, we're going to, it's going, it should lead us to emphasize 
certain sort of rights of voice and decision making and participation and so forth. So the theory is the liberty. I use the, the liberty process, principle, right? That we think will get us to certain results. And so I'm wondering, sort of, what drove you to spin it that way rather than the first way? If you're uh, using Rawls. Here. Okay, that's great because that was not the question I thought you were going to ask. Which and so, and hopefully, no one will think of the question I thought you were going to ask. Okay. Um, I have not thought through the difference principle enough, and I didn't want to talk about it today because I think it's extremely difficult to figure out. Because I think partially, I'm going through a reflective equilibrium right now. Too much equality starts to bother me, in all honesty. Now, maybe that bothering me, I'm wrong about, and I'll eventually come to what you originally said. Or maybe I will figure out why it's bothering me and be able to respond. But since I am still in the middle of reflecting on the difference principle and how that works, I don't know what to say about it. Okay? So, but I think at the very least I can say under the liberty principle that um, this would, it, people in the original position would come to some form of, um, of participation in the workplace. Now, remember, this is political, not workplace, but I tie it into some, with the coercion of the business versus the um, in, uh, government. But you see why I did that for now? I, I mean, these are like lifelong, these are my, this is my lifelong theory. So I'm going to hopefully work on it for another at least 20 years, okay? And there's a lot more work to do here. And Rawls is just a more recent por part, portion of the autonomous dignified worker. And like I said, I think the difference principle is, for me, very challenging because it could lead to a society that I find a little too equal, but maybe that's something bad in me, and I haven't figured that out yet. Okay? Yeah. 